I want to welcome all of you to the beautiful members room here in the Thomas Jefferson Building of the Library of Congress. We're very, very fortunate and honored today to have with us Chief Justice John Roberts from the United States Supreme Court and the Right Honorable the Lord Judge, former Lord Chief Justice of England and Wales. They've both graciously agreed to sit down with us today to have a conversation about Magna Carta and its legal legacy. Tomorrow's a very big day for us here at the Library of Congress, and in particular, the staff of the Law Library. For three years, we've been planning and working, and so finally tomorrow, we will be able to open officially our exhibit, Magna Carta, Muse and Mentor. It'll be right upstairs here in the South Gallery of this building. The centerpiece for the Library of Congress exhibition will be the magnificent Lincoln, King John Magna Carta, which is graciously loaned to us uh, to the library from Lincoln Cathedral in Lincoln, England. Um, it is one of the four existing exemplifications or, or copies of Magna Carta that King John granted in 1215. Some of you may know that in 1939, in November of 1939, uh, the Lincoln uh, Magna Carta was entrusted to the Library of Congress and then put on display, but it was entrusted to us for safekeeping at the very beginning of World War II. So, our exhibition upstairs will help illustrate Magna Carta's uh, influence on the history of rule of law and its impact on the development of the constitutional order here in America. Uh, and in particular, it highlights uh, several legal principles which draw their roots from 17th century interpretations of Magna Carta. Um, and those are legal principles like the, the principle of representative government, uh, the right to due process of law, uh, the right to trial by jury, uh, the protection from unlawful imprisonment, um, the um, privilege of the writ of habeas corpus, and of course the theory of limited government. So what better way than to prepare for tomorrow's opening to sit with Chief Justice Roberts and Lord Judge to have a conversation about this great document to hear their thoughts on its legacy. So thank you very much, uh, Lord Judge and Chief sure. Justice Roberts. Now Chief Justice Roberts, as I'm sure most of you know, began his appointment as Chief Justice of the United States and head of the federal judiciary here in the United States uh, in 2005. Lord Judge was appointed uh, Lord Chief Justice of England and Wales in 2008. Um, and as Lord Chief Justice of England and Wales, he was head of the judiciary and president of the courts of England and Wales. Um, I should probably mention one other thing, that in addition to both of them leading the judiciary in their respective countries, one other item that they have in common is that both are benchers of the Honorable Society of the Middle Temple, which is one of the four uh, ancient uh, organizations in England that has the privilege of calling their members to be barristers uh, in England. So with that uh, introduction, I thought we could start with our conversation focusing on Magna Carta and its meaning to us uh, in the present time, in modern times. And so when we talk about Magna Carta now, we focus on the fact that uh, it was a great influence on the le development of legal systems across the world and on the rise of the modern state. But we also know that uh, in the United Kingdom, in particular, uh, most of the provisions of Magna Carta have been repealed. And certainly in the United States, uh, if Magna Carta were ever considered uh, constitutional law, and I say that with a small c, um, certainly it would have been superseded by the United States Constitution. Um, so my question is, why is it important for us, for our respective countries, to continue to commemorate Magna Carta in this way? And I will start with Justice Roberts. Thank you. Um, well, it is, of course, first and foremost, an, an uh, imposing symbol. Um, uh, the exact origins of it, I don't think it would have been regarded as um, a bill of rights when it was issued. Uh, uh, the barons and the king, I don't think, were terribly interested in promulgating uh, rights that would apply across the board. Uh, but over time, it has become a critical symbol. It was um, a vital symbol during our revolution. John Adams referred to it frequently. Um, if you look at the original seal for the state of Massachusetts, it shows a, a militiaman with a sword in one hand uh, and a copy of Magna Carta in the other. Uh, it, it, it embodied for the colonists, first what they were looking for in the beginning. They were not looking for independence, they were looking for the rights of Englishmen to which they thought they were entitled and those were represented by Magna Carta. Um, uh, and it was as the state seal of Massachusetts engraved by Paul Revere 
uh, shows that's what they were fighting for. The sword in one hand, Magna Carta in the other. Uh, and you mentioned the 1939 uh, uh, transfer of Magna Carta for safekeeping. Uh, again, that was an extraordinarily powerful symbol. Um, uh, the British did not uh, give it over lightly, um, and I think they did so in a very calculated way. They wanted to remind us um, uh, that this is what they were fighting for and convey the strong message that you should be too. Um, uh, so it is very useful as a symbol that represents uh, the rule of law, uh, liberties. It's, it's been reinvented over the years. Um, uh, the American colonists, when they looked to it, were looking to it as interpreted by Blackstone, uh, uh, which gave a lot more uh, substance to it as a charter of liberty than, than I think um, might have been done in earlier uh, centuries. But it was a powerful symbol at the time of the Revolution. It continued to be a powerful symbol uh, uh, at the time of the Second World War. And it's available uh, uh, whenever you do need resort to something that in a tangible way represents these basic fundamental liberties. Lord Judge? I rather agree with that. And I, I think that what the Chief Justice has said about Magna Carta being here in 1939 reminds us that although this sounds as though it's an academic subject, it isn't. In 1939 and 1940, there was a very strong possibility, indeed, I put it further, by the end of 1940, all Europe, bar the islands offshore, was under the jackboot. Now, it's easy for us sitting in this beautiful building uh, to take for granted that all the things that matter to us about our freedoms are there to be last forever. Well, they don't necessarily last forever. In 1939-40, England was very close, Britain was very close to losing the war. For the charter to be here meant that it would be preserved. Of course, Lincoln Cathedral wanted it back. Any cathedral that's got a 1215 <laughs> charter has got a treasure of, well, infinite magnitude. But if you don't take for granted, don't take your freedoms for granted, then Magna Carta becomes a much more vivid, vibrant document. If I may just go back to it, there are actually four charters, 1215, 1216, 1217, 1225. None of them is called Magna Carta. King John never signed one, he sealed it. And the three things that are perhaps most important in it are one clause that people always forget. It's clause 61, and it's from this that we take the very vivid principle that nobody is above the law. No king, king anointed, God's servant inherits by divine luck, you could call it, but right. Now, every king in medieval Europe made an oath that he'd be a good king, do lots of justice, look after lots of poor people, all the sort of things that you'd want your new king to do. But in medieval Europe, if the king didn't, answer, didn't provide justice and so on and so forth, I'm afraid they took the view that he had to answer to God in heaven. Well. When the king's dead, it's not much good if you've had no justice or you've not been properly looked after. And what Magna Carta did was to say in Clause 61, if the king does not abide by the charter when he's notified that he's in breach of it, in effect, a council of 25 barons can take over the running of the kingdom. They're not to harm him, they're not to injure him, they're not, of course, to treat him with violence or his family, but they're no longer stuck with their oaths of allegiance and fealty. This, I think, is a fantastically important moment. Suddenly, the king is answerable on earth, not just in heaven. And from this, we derive constant references through the Middle Ages to the king not being above the law. The law comes first. The king comes second. He's certainly the most important person in the kingdom, but he is beneath the law. And that, I think, leads us to this, I think, really important point, which it's easy in a democracy to overlook, but which in any dictatorship would be no trouble at all. No king is above the law. No president is above the law. No executive is above the law. Everyone is answerable for his actions or her actions in court. And that leads to the second, but I'm not going to talk about this too long, but 
we're all entitled to justice. The, the, the clauses don't just say justice, they talk about right and justice. Now, there weren't many rights about in 1215, but over the centuries our rights have come to be established. And you find the preservation, the entitlement to a, a court system that will preserve your rights is there found within the Charter. And I regard the insistence in the Charter on right and justice as being its second most important legacy to us, because again, here in the office of Chief Justice of the United States, the office I once held in England, we are there responsible for seeing that justice is available to all our citizens, even if they're taking on the president, or they're taking on the government, the prime minister in our case, all a great local body, great local authority. These rights are recognized in the Charter. The barons weren't thinking of us. The barons weren't, you know, full of ideas about voting. Of course they weren't. But as our country developed, and then yours did uh, from ours in the constitutional arrangements, um, these things became part of the country. In England now, if somebody says something, you know, let's do something that most people would regard as diabolical and dictatorial, um, everybody says, well, it's against Magna Carta. It isn't against Magna Carta. There isn't a word in Magna Carta about trial by jury. But people think of Magna Carta as representing their rights, their entitlements, the need for justice to be done, and most important of all, equality before the law. Um, so, yes, if you say Magna Carta, you're probably uh, a bit short of better authority, but nevertheless, it remains a, a useful reminder to all of us, including the judges, that there are some very basic principles which govern our lives, uh, govern our judicial lives, and which we should be alert to. And then bear in mind, and one last point on this, uh, David said at his introduction, we talk about due process, we talk about habeas corpus, uh, we talk about impartial juries, we have a Bill of Rights in England, you have a, your Bill of Rights here. These are in direct lineage from Magna Carta. So the fact that if council comes along and says Magna Carta is my best authority, that doesn't seem very strong. When you examine the lineage which has come down to us from Magna Carta, many of the arguments which are well-founded stem originally from the thought processes that have developed over the last 800 years.